Here we go. Hi, Mary. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I am so happy to have you. So for people who doesn't know you, we are with Mary Spencer. Mary Spencer, great, great Canadian female boxer. Canadian boxer. I don't like to say Canadian female or fem Canadian female boxer. It's not relevant anymore. <laughs> um, I'm a fan. You know, for me, it's like being in front of someone I like so much and I followed so much, you know, uh, through all your, your, through the years, you know, the past 10, uh, 10, 15 years. So I'm very, very, very happy. It's a, it's, it's a huge honor for me to have you with me today. Thank to you. Chat. Thank you. And you know what? I'm a fan of yours as well. And I want to let you know that I noticed when I was at um, Jessica Kamara's world title fight that you were there you were there yes. um watching the fight and uh and following up about the fight and supporting women boxing so i'm a fan as well ah thank you so much <laughs> so you, you're a great 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 <clears throat> boxer from canada so many canadian titles as an amateur how many uh, eight ten how many canadian titles you had i'm not sure Let's say between eight and ten. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Yeah, a minimum of eight at least. Uh, Olympian, three times world champion, right? Three right. times. That's quite yeah. impressive. Uh, model for cover girl. Out of the blue, that was <laughs> that's interesting in your career. I was like, oh yeah, I remember she was in commercials in advertisement for cover girls for makeups during the Olympic time. I don't know what yeah. you're talking about. This is cool. Uh, awarded a meritorious service decoration from the government of Canada for becoming the first Canadian Indigenous women to compete at the Olympics. This is impressive. This is impressive. And so much more. You know, your resume is very, very uh, filled. It's filled with all the uh, so many achievements. You're Ontario bor born, but you're relocated in, in Montreal, right? Correct. And you, you surprised everyone last year yeah, by turning pro at 36 years old. I was not <laughs> expecting this. Okay. I was so happy. Uh, so we'll talk about it first. Okay. Uh, Mary, I thought that when you, you, you decided to stop boxing as an amateur, that you had no more plans, but no, you, you decided to turn pro. Tell us why. You know what, Mary I think that I am cut out for pro. I've always thought that. I've thought that uh, I think I'm going to make a much better pro than an amateur. And, you know, the only thing that held me back is just knowing, like, once you turn pro, you can't come back to amateur. You know what I mean? So it's always like, oh, do I want to hang around for a few more years? Maybe I do. It's one of those decisions. Like, it's not like cutting your hair. You can cut your hair off knowing it's going to grow back, right? But try something. Home, it's like you can't turn back. It's kind of, you know, it's hard to make that jump. So, so that I just was need to mainly make sure that was all done. You. Yeah, that was mainly what stopped you at the, to turn pro earlier. Part of it. That's part. part of it. But I mean, like, I'm sure you know that, like, back in the day, there wasn't really any excitement. True or I should say too much excitement. There was little bits and pieces of excitement. Sometimes there'd be a really exciting professional fighter or once in a while an exciting division, but now it's, it's really different, you know, where it's like, okay, this could be a lot of fun. There's some, some uh, tough girls in here. You're seeing girls on um, big cards more often. It's not brand new, but you see it no. more. Um, it so, has evolved a lot. That's true. Gyms are filled with yeah. young girls trying to learn uh, the sport, <clears throat> the discipline, and it will continue to evolve a lot uh, in the next sure. five years. I'm pretty sure of that. And yes, you're right. There's a not a brand new excitement, but like more consistent excitement. Let's say That's let's right. say this that way. Um, yeah. You are a welterweight right welterweight. now. Yeah, Sorry. Jessica McCaskill has everything. She owns all the belts <laughs> as a welterweight. Uh, when yeah. you decided to turn pro, I'm pretty sure your goal is to reach her quite fast. You want to have a chance to get a belt, at least. Um, how do we do when we know all the belts are taken? 
and you, you know you're not 30 years old anymore you're not 25 so you don't have 10 years to reach your goal of having a championship fight how do we proceed what kind of plan uh, we make in order to, to to reach a girl like Jessica McCaskill mm. fast let's say well first of all I didn't turn pro thinking I want to fight Jessica McCaskill um, but because, like you pointed out, I'm a welterweight and she is the undisputed welterweight champion, that's obviously something that I want to achieve first. Um, I won't say that's the main goal. It's definitely not my end goal. It's, um, it's a goal along the way. Uh, it's obviously a big goal, but it's a goal along the way. And how do you get there? Well, that's what I've been trying to figure out, you know, like being in boxing so long, but not in amateur, or, sorry, not in professional boxing whatsoever it has just been like, um, it's been interesting to turn pro and kind of like see how everything works. And I'm still not completely sure how everything works. You know what I mean? But yes, what yes, I yes. am doing, yeah, but what I am doing is I'm looking at who are the people who are getting the opportunity that I want. The opportunity that I want is uh, a chance to fight her. Yeah. for all the titles or some of the titles or whatever however that works and so i'm looking like who's there well the last person to be there was candy wyatt yes not uh, long time ago Canadian. a couple of weeks ago <clears throat> you know right you know and she's got maybe a dozen fights under her belt i'm not exactly sure okay. right now but but something like that i think so and and so it's like okay well that's that's one place to start like women aren't needing 20 and 0 records to get title shots True. so that's one way that you can just move so much quicker is um you're getting those shots a lot sooner and even 12 fights is even kind of a lot i'm seeing people getting title shots with a lot less you know even in single digits nine fights stuff like that um so i think it's going to be a matter of you know how quickly i can move and so that is my number one priority right now Exactly. So probably for this year, <clears throat> you will try, you may try to fight often, the more, uh, as often as you can do it. You're it's not easy. And we out. all know it's not easy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You don't have a promoter, right? You are without, a, you, you are a free bird. You, you, you're not fine with any promoter. Is it a decision no or you're still, uh, you're still, you, you would be interested in having one? Um, I have never actively sought a promoter. Uh, in fact, when I think of moving fast, I think it's hard to see a promoter in that picture. Um, you know, typically I feel like promoters kind of slow people down a little bit. Uh, and obviously, obviously I have no time for that. So I'm, I haven't looked for one and I'm still not looking for one. And that's not in the plan. No, that, that, and you know, I talked to um, Raquel Miller not long time ago, and she was uh, she had she used to have a promoter, and she decided to go um, as a freelance as well as a free bird, and you know, to manage her own things by herself. We start mm -hmm. to see it more than before, probably because, as you said, it can slower you if the promoter is the owner of your time and of your timeline and deciding everything for you it may not follow the path you want to follow yourself so yeah it, it really depends it really depends so yeah. so let's see what's what's gonna happen uh with the pandemic i know it's complicated as well so you surprised everyone as well because you know turning pro in the middle of a pandemic it, it, you know, <laughs> your game, your game, <laughs> you have guts, uh, it, it, because it's not so, it's not easy for, for, you know, sports in general, for women's boxing, even less uh, right now, because opportunities are not so um, frequent, <clears throat> I can say that. Um, I was, I'm checking, I'm checking the ranking right now, right now. Jessica McCaskill is on top, but I'm on box rank, okay? And it could be yeah. different from one association sure. to another. Cecilia Breckis, she may leave for uh, the super middle, uh, the super welterweight division, maybe. I'm not sure. Um, you see Victoria Noelia Bustos, Alma Ibarra, Candy Wyatt is, yeah, you were talking about Candy Wyatt. She's number six right now in on box rank. Um, but like 
as you said, she doesn't have so many fights uh, right now. She has a record. Uh, uh, she's 10-4. So, uh, and she's, oh, uh, she's okay. yeah, she's 10 4, yeah. 10, but number six uh, <clears throat> in box rec, right? which is not the Bible, you know, it's one tool that we have. It's I, not what? I, I do believe <laughs> it's not one what? tool that we have. Uh, I do believe you're so dangerous in this division. I check all the names, okay? And I know yeah. your background, your amateur background, but also your skills, not only. Uh, amateur background because when we compare professional boxing and amateur boxing <clears throat> a lot of people they would say it's different it's not exactly the same sport what do you think about it well you have tried you're starting with the professional do you see a lot of differences right now just because you're a good amateur does not mean you're going to be a good pro and same goes the other way around too um maybe you're not a great amateur but you're going to be a great pro so uh, I think, yeah, they're very different. They're very distinct. Um, there's some big things that separate them, you know? Like, I think you can get by in amateurs without really liking to fight as long as you like boxing. And the pros, I don't think you can get by unless you truly like to fight. So it kind of, um, yeah, it kind of just like, change it's, then, i don't know it's a it makes a big difference though but also we in, in the amateurs you fight on three minute rounds uh in the pro it's two minute rounds right now it's not divided the same with sports it's, it's different you know boxing is boxing but you have many kinds of boxing but you were telling me earlier that you were you, you would have wanted to try the pros before but you decided not to do it because you couldn't come back to the amateurs easily it was not possible at a certain point but that you have a kind of pro style already um and we noticed it very fast because in your two first fights <laughs> we saw you know you had knockouts very fast knockouts and it doesn't happen that often in the amateurs you know it's typically pro to see that kind of performances um but I see the names in the list and I see where you are right now, where you are at on box rec. And I see the, the, the women, um, you know, uh, above you. And I'm like, they don't know. They don't know what, what, what they don't know what this woman can do. No, they have to don't know because you will knock no. at their door. <laughs> you will knock at their door so soon. They won't, they won't be able to avoid you. Because the division, you know, is not filled with two, 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 uh, two, two thousand, two thousand women. It's not a division with a lot of women. They won't have a choice to fight mm -hmm. you at a short, short term. You will still climb. You will, you still be climbing, and you will knock at their doors. Here in Canada, we were talking about uh, Candy Wyatt. You have Candy Wyatt. You have Marie Pierre Hull in Montreal as well. Same division. Maybe Marie F. Dicker. Right now she's a uh, 154, but she is talking about an interest to go down to 147. Even here in okay. Canada, maybe we will have very good local fights uh, short terms. That's what I'm expecting. I would love it. Everybody in Canada knows that I would be game for anyone in Canada right now. Everybody knows that. But will I fight anyone in Canada? I don't. I don't know. I hope so. I hope so. Are they avoiding but... you, in your opinion? Are they interested, hey, first of all? You know what? <clears throat> Have I approached anyone to see if they wanted to fight? No, I haven't personally. Um, I think my coach has reached out for who will to fight, and that's a no-go. Um, uh, but the others, no, we haven't. We haven't. I mean, one is... A former world champion and one just had a world title fight and i have two fights so i know that i need to build up a record and uh and then move like that but i don't know i don't know you're talking about um fighting canadian fighters and i have no idea if that's in the cards for me or not but hey who knows i'm down if it, i mean i'm down if anyone else is but we'll how did see. you start boxing uh, mary because i think your first love was basketball right um i used to love basketball yeah and i started boxing 
to get in shape for basketball, actually. Oh. That was kind of the idea behind it. But really, I think I was just excited to be able to go boxing because my friend invited me to go to the gym one day and uh, to get in shape. And like, I had always thought that I wanted to fight. I always looked around at like my peers, even as like a little kid, I'd look around at my peers and be like, I bet I can whip all these girls. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really know why I would think like that because it's not like I was in any kind of like combat sport or anything, but maybe just because I had an older brother and we would go home and fight all the time and I would, you know, test my strength against him. But I'd look around and be like, yeah, I'd love, I'd love to be able to fight, get into a fighting sport. So when I had the chance to, yeah, I was a basketball player, but I quickly fell in love with boxing. And you became very, very good fast, I think. You started boxing, <clears throat> and not long time ago, you were already Canadian champion, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, I started fighting in 2002, and by 2004, I had won a Canadian championship. Um, I have to say, like, in 2002, there weren't that many women who were boxing full-time. But I started as a 17-year-old who had just been kicked out of high school, and I had nothing to do. Mm -hmm. I wasn't in school anymore. I had a weekend job. Um, and, you know, eventually, you know, through the summer I was working. But when I first started boxing, I had all the time in the world. So I really started at a perfect time. And my coach really jumped on that up, jumped on that opportunity. You know, uh, I call it an opportunity, but I mean, like he kind of looked at the situation like a 17 year old who likes this sport. Um, time. And, and, and me telling her to train full time is, is possible because she doesn't have anything going on. You know what I mean? So <laughs> that's what happened. You know, I moved Timing fast, was perfect but... for you. Timing was perfect for you and for the coach. Timing was so perfect. Uh, a lot okay. of things kind of lined up in my favor to make it, to make it happen. So. And also being so young, a Canadian champion, it gave you opportunities to travel and to face very fast, very good boxers. The that's elite, right, yeah. let's yeah. say this, this is an opportunity of improvement that is important as well even if there was less there were less boxers female boxers at that time having mm -hmm. the opportunity of traveling the world to face the best ones available is always good uh, how many um how many uh, amateur fight did, did, did you uh, did you uh, did you have i had 176 fights and not a lot of losses i think <laughs> Honestly, I lost track. Like I lost track a long time ago. I used to be able to count my losses, but then they started building up a little bit near the end of my career there. But um, yeah, no. Um, you faced like a lot of women who are or with or, who are pro right now. Frank Frank Chen, Cruz De Zern, <clears throat> Clarissa Shields. So many. Uh, I think you're probably one of the women who faced Clarissa Shield the most. The most. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, Ariane Fortin as well. Uh, Ariane Fortin was here in Canada. There was a kind of rivalry between them, between both of you at a certain point. A rival, a, pro, a rivalry in boxing. But was it the same outside, outside the gym, as an example, or not that much? What do you mean was it the same outside the gym? And were you able to, to, to be friends outside or it's always difficult when you arrive all uh, for, for, for a medal, as an example, or a, a Canadian title? Is it possible to develop a relationship with a rival? Oh, well, you know what? It's, it's not like she was a rival first. She was a friend and a teammate and then a rival. So it was different. You know what I mean? Yes. And I think because it developed like that, yeah, hey, like, We're both very competitive and we've always been competitive so when we had to fight it was like okay well this turns into a rivalry now and and that's it you know like uh it wouldn't have mattered who it was that's just kind of yeah it has to happen sometimes at a certain <laughs> point it has, it has to happen to. both it you wanted to, to, to go to the olympics <laughs> yeah if you're competitive enough it has to happen if somebody 
doesn't care or doesn't believe in themselves or whatever, then, hey, it's not going to turn into a rivalry. But if you have two people who are both good boxers and both wine or both competitive, of course it's going to. Yeah, there was a documentary about uh, this rivalry and this rivalry uh, made in your preparation for the Olympics, I think. It was uh, the, the name was Last Woman Standing. Uh, it happened. Uh, oh, what, what was the importance of this documentary in your preparation? Was this was it a distraction? Um, because it was like it, uh, people who doesn't know about this. This documentary was uh, about you and Ariane. They were following both of you as rivals, trying to get the only spot to the Olympic available, yeah. and being the first women ever Canadian women ever to be at the Olympics in boxing. <laughs> Kind of, so, was it? I mean, it's, it's not it's not common to see to see something like this. There was a kind of a, um, attention focused on both of you because of that. Um, yeah. Was it a distraction in the preparation? <clears throat> how how they proposed this project to both of you? Okay, so I'll tell you something kind of funny. I was thinking about it not that long ago, actually. Um, so these filmmakers from Montreal. Mm -hmm. And so imagine me and my coach in Windsor training to fight Ariane. It's been a three year process because it started in 2010 and went all the way through to the Olympics in 2012. So one day we're approached by these filmmakers in Montreal who want to come and do some filming and do this documentary. And my coach at first, well, not even at first. The whole time he was like, they're spies. <laughs> <laughs> so he was, he was partly joking, but we didn't actually ever do like training or anything in front of them because he always had them back in his head. Like, we don't know these people. They're coming from our <laughs> opponents, our rivals backyard to come and film the training yeah right so um we didn't really let it be a huge distraction just because of that because he was kind of a little like leery of it was them. suspicious of it he was totally suspicious <laughs> <laughs> yes but, i um, can understand as well like yeah, I can understand <laughs> as well because it's not common yeah. either. You see this, and there was like only one spot available for the Olympics. You know, this is yeah. the way it is. Eh? The best one, or the, not even not necessarily the best one, but the winner gets uh, the, the chance. So yeah. But let's remember why when you say that that's the way it is. Let's remember mm -hmm. why that was the way it is. Why was it that two women who were each two-time world champions in their respective divisions had to face each other to go to the Olympics. That was because when women got their first shot at boxing in the Olympics, finally, after having qualified um, regarding the number of world championships, the number of countries participating, once we finally got to go and were made equal, three divisions got to go. Yes, that so, was very little. So prob if you wanted to go to the Olympics, you needed to fit in one of the three divisions that were chosen. That's right. And not allowing every division like they do in, uh, on the men's side at the time. It's changed now. Um, but it really, it really um, created some hardships for women boxers across the world i can believe it and because, was just yeah, one of those because things. ariane decided to to to, sw to swap division to change uh, uh, to, to go did. to your division in in oh, order no, to no. <laughs> no no ariane went up one a division to go and you went and down i went up two oh, i'm oh, a welterweight remember yes 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 that's even I worse i was a welterweight <laughs> as an amateur Yes, I was a welterweight as an amateur for seven years before I went up two divisions. That's what happened. So both of you got the same idea. They decided you decided both to try your luck uh, in this division because you wanted a spot. And I can well, understand we're, it. We're both competitive. Yes. We're both full time boxers. We're both world champions. Of course, we're going to both do that. 
You know, yeah. if there was a possibility that I could have gone down, I would have gone down. But I was fighting at 140.8 at the time, so 64 kilos. And they took 60 kilos and another four kilo cut for me, I think would have uh, not been possible. Well, I know no. it would have not been possible. So it has to, to stay healthy at a certain <clears throat> point as well. You know, you got to stay alive at a certain point. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you need to continue to be able to eat <laughs> and or, or or stop eating, depending who, <laughs> you know. So, no, but, but so you got you had uh, you 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 got the spot for London. Um, that year was tremendous for you because you had that contract with Cover Girl. You got the spot. It was that documentary three years. You said that they were uh, filming you and seeing the process. Um, you uh, you were featuring in Chatelain in different uh, you know magazines, modeling on TV and so on. Uh, then and you were a real um. You, people they were expecting you to get a medal there was a kind of social pressure i think on on your shoulders because you were you you had uh three you had been a three time world champion you were on tv you you were like the spotlight was on you a lot that year uh, do you think all this pressure influenced a little bit your olympic performance or not really <clears throat> Pressure is something, if you're going to win three world championships, it's something that's not going to um, throw off your game, obviously. Um, although women boxing, there wasn't a lot of pressure, but it's there's still different kind of, kinds of pressures. For years, I had the pressure of, you know, in order to keep my um, funding with Sport Canada and be able to be a full-time athlete, I had to medal at a world championship. So imagine every two years you have to prove yourself um, on that kind of stage, you know what I mean, to get that funding. That was pressure. And you do that, you put up with that kind of stuff. But, so I don't think that that's what it was. Um, you mentioned the cover girl contract. That actually came about a year and a half before the yeah. Olympics. So that would have come before I went to uh, the Pan Am Games, even. Yes. Um, and the movie, the first last woman standing. <laughs> say the name right. Last woman standing. It actually yes. did. Yeah, they did the filming over the years, but they actually didn't. Uh, it didn't come out until 2013. So, not all of that was packed into that one year. But of course, anytime it's Olympic year, there's all kinds of, you know, Olympic. Um, commercials, Olympic advertising, and Olympic events, and, and stuff like that. So, yeah, that was distracting. Um, yes, it added pressure, but the pressure, I don't think, was as detrimental as people say it was. And you know what's interesting is I've heard so many people who've already determined in their mind what happened, why I didn't perform. And it's interesting because I'm the only one who hasn't um, talked to any media about why I didn't perform. But I'm, I'm interested when I hear other people's perspectives because I hear a lot of the same stuff, like um, the cover girl distracted you. But that was three days. They were the least intrusive of everything. It was yeah. three days of my life that I traded um, for that contract and, and they did what they wanted with those three days. And it happened in a year, not an Olympic year, the year before actually. Um, but but yeah, I, I don't think I don't think it had as much of an effect as most people think it did. So when you went there, you lost against a Chinese girl in the quarterfinals. Yeah. For you, what I understand from what you say. Well, it was not about distractions you had before. It was <clears throat> about boxing, about about boxing, or was it something else? Uh, and if you have to explain what happened, and because because you lost and you were expecting a medal, you were close. Eh? 
you were not far from a medal. Yeah, you were close. close to a medal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's pretty close. We, we cannot very, very close. So yeah. for you, how, how would you, ex how would you uh, explain this now? Now we are 10 years later. Okay. So 10 years later. Yeah. If I needed an explanation for not meddling at the Olympics after moving up 24 pounds to compete in, if I were to come up with a reason why I didn't medal, or what I thought had the most effect, um, negative effect on my performance, I mean, it always comes down to your preparation. It always comes down to your preparation. And if you prepare properly, it doesn't matter if that happens and um, you know, at the time of the event, whatever, you get through that, you know, you're, you're ready to go. But just after Christmas, before 2012, my coach that I've had since 2001 had a brain injury, an early dementia. Well, I shouldn't say early, he was an old man when that happened, but he became forgetful. Um, the training wasn't the same and he really had a sharp decline. And so while that was happening, I was kind of like freaking out a little bit. And that's when I got a call from Boxing Canada that we're doing a training camp. I have always said, no, I'm not participating in your training camp for major, major competition because my training at home has always been 10 times better than anything that ever happened at boxing camp mm -hmm. training camp so i'd always refused and i'd always um been in a position where i could refuse you know i genuinely uh, genuinely was training hard at home and when i would refuse to do that i would be a multiple time world champion refusing to do that going on to another world championship and winning gold so I was able to kind of, you know, say yes or no to things like that. You had the, you had point, the option. You had the, the option to decide. I did, yeah. In this um, scenario, my training was not how it should have been. And so when I was told to do the training camp, I said, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, I hope, I hope this can, you know, fix this training that has been inconsistent, that has been um, not up to par with what I'm used to. Um, and so I went to training camp and to my dismay, it was an all men's training camp for one month where I had zero sparring partners. So I'm taken out of my regular routine for months because of issues with my coach only to go to a training camp that also did not prepare me whatsoever. And I knew going to that stadium that I was the least prepared for a fight that I had ever been in my entire life. And a girl the I had The impact is there, the, the impact is huge. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. like 10 years after, it's easier as well probably to talk about it because you, yeah. you have, you're you you're older, you're somewhere else right now. It's mm -hmm. not like a fresh, fresh, fresh. Um, but yeah. and add to this that you were not in your regular weight category in the Olympics, <laughs> it changed, you know, it changed the perspective as well because you don't face the same people, the same girls. Um, some of these girls are in their natural weight category, so they are more at ease probably uh, than you uh, in in that situation <laughs> and so on. So I, it's very clear. I really understand your point. Um, preparation was the key. You weren't prepared the way you used to be prepared before. Mm -hmm. And it has it had an impact, a direct impact on your Olympic performance. But it's already a huge achievement to go to the Olympics, to be the first Canadian female woman to be there. You know, to have a spot there <laughs> at the very first time. You know, the Olympics are open to women. Uh, this yeah. is how was the feeling when you arrived in London? How was this feeling of uh, being there? Because, you know, 10 years before, when you started boxing, it was not even the plan. Right. Right. But listen, though, 
my feeling in the Olympics was a feeling of not being prepared. So uh, that dominated my entire experience. In from the, the very beginning, from the first second. I've been bothered going to the opening ceremonies. Like I was, you know, soaking up the experience. Like I don't know, maybe some athletes do, but it wasn't that. It was, it was um, me being like, damn. Yeah. I will do my best, but I'm, <laughs> I'm not very safe. I don't feel safe. <laughs> that was maybe the feeling. I don't feel safe about myself. Yeah, well, I can understand. If you knew already before leaving, of course, you couldn't enjoy that much your, your total experience because of that. Okay. Yeah. Because you were focused on your performance as well as a, you know. I think, I think every Olympian is. I think yes. every Olympian is. Um, you know, focus on their performance. And, you know, if you had a, a good performance, chances are you really had a good time. <laughs> but <laughs> Let's talk a, a little bit about your community involvement, because, you know, you're a First Nation member from the Chippewas of Nawash. Oh, I don't know if I pronounce it properly, First Nation. Close, yeah, yeah, of Nawash. I, this is the, the, the name I found because it changed. It was another another name before. Um, say you, <laughs> <laughs> uh, in 2014, you won an Inspire Award, uh, award to celebrate Indigenous people uh, with great career achievements, right? You participated as well in Motivate Canada's Gen 7 Aboriginal Role Model Initiative. That's what I found, and it's very interesting. All this, what space? How important is the men, is the mentorship for you? How important it is because you're kind of mentor sometimes for young, for youth, for for young Aboriginal people. You have been involved a lot in communities to try to help people, <clears throat> young people, fulfill their dreams or their goals. How important is mentorship? You know what I started. Um, working with a program you mentioned, Morty Kendall, it's a mentorship program for Indigenous youth. Um, I started doing that because in 2010, at the Canadian Championship, um, I was chatting with a coach that I had, you know, seen around and been friendly with, you know, um, Kent Brown from Winnipeg. And we had added each other on Facebook, I guess. And he came up to me at that tournament and he was like, hey, I never knew you were native. And I was like, oh, are you? And he's like, yeah. And like, well, I didn't know you were either. <laughs> and he's like, until I saw you fix on Facebook, I'm like, okay, well, I didn't know until just right now that you told me. <laughs> and he goes, what do you want to do after boxing? And, you know, I was thinking like, I wanted to be a coach and I had just started seeing this um this gym not in windsor but in a town nearby windsor in chatham mm -hmm. and had a program that brought some youth from a nearby reserve uh walpool island to the gym and one of those boxers became canadian champion that's tyler Kweosh. and i was thinking like i'd love to be part of something like that that'd be super cool you know um get more kids from different reserves doing boxing and he was like, well, listen, I started this program called Gen 7. And um, basically, we're going and, and mentoring these youth and teaching them sport and, and trying to bring sport to the communities. So that's how I got started doing that type of um, that type of work was working with Kent. And he um, had a program in Cross Lake, Manitoba, where he was, you know, um, starting a boxing club in the community and so i tagged along with him got doing stuff like that uh also in my own community and um, a few others that were near windsor and then once in a while up north um and when that program ended it was just like i was left with this very clear well i shouldn't say very clear but a better understanding of the lack of access to sport in communities and a ton of untapped potential, but also an answer for a lot of um, problems that are, uh, yeah, you know, there for for 
youth, especially living on a reserve. So it, it, it's something that's kind of turned into a project and I've found different ways to um, um, continue with the same work through um, through my job and um, yeah. Yeah, the, 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 <laughs> that's, that's true. But that's true. Uh, that, that's true. Sport in general is can be the key to a better life when you have problems and problems that maybe not a lot of people understand. It. Still, you know, uh, you, you, we, we, we hear a lot of talkings and chatting about um, the problems in a reserve but it's not there is hope as well you know not only problems and sport is a part of this can create a, a, a thirst for 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 opportunities for fulfilling dreams for uh, being a good person you know this is how it is uh, sport not only for aboriginal kids but for kids in general can be a part of many solutions for many problems i think i this think is, so too i think yeah. so too and like when i think about like i grew up in windsor ontario about 250 000 people i had access to all kinds of sports inside and outside of school and i allowed well i insisted on sport taking up all of my free time outside of school and i did that for years and um i've met a lot of people who like myself will say sport changed their life or gave them opportunities or you know did so much um to assist with growing up and finding your place in the world and to think that there are children in our country in our provinces who don't have any access to any sport is sad and it's not right it doesn't feel it doesn't feel um, like it should keep happening so i just want to do my part to address that and find ways to to do it you know and i love sport <laughs> so well you love sport and you're a role model you know for all those kids you're you're a role model as well because you practice you practice sport but you succeeded as well and you built your life around this you know not only mm. around this but around this mainly you know so it gives a uh, it gives an opportunity it's it's a way uh, of being a role model for those kids even if your dream is not being uh, you, you know uh, being a professional athlete or going to the olympics it's just a good way to see how things can from a dream, a simple dream, how a life can evolve as well. And if you, if your dream is science or going to university or anything else, it's the same. It's a bit the same. Uh, it's not only sport, but in a certain way, a role model because you took, you, you took, you, you, you were not. You, you told me earlier, I was not going to school anymore. You know, when uh, and I had time. Uh, I was 17. I was training uh, full time. And this gave you the opportunity of being the one you are right now because of sports, because you had this. If you had no sports in your life, maybe you would be, uh, your, your life would be totally different, probably. <laughs> so You know what I was going to say, Miriam? I, I was going to say that anyone who's around, well, I was just going to say that we're all role models because you kept on bringing up the role model part. And it's like, we all are though. Like kids don't pick and choose. You know what I mean? Anytime, whoever's around them, they, they look up to and they, they, they model behavior and they, they pick up on how you do things. So it's not like I chose to be that. We all just are. <laughs> Yeah, and, the good. We yeah. are role models. We can be positive or negative, role models mm -hmm. uh, as well. So you're right, and that's that's great to uh, to to say, to say it that way because <clears throat> people we forget in general that we can be a role model for a kid for another adult as well. You know, when, no matter what we do, uh, it, our behavior can inspire people, um, in a positive or negative way. I would say. Yeah. So let's try to be positive. But like, <laughs> you're, you're right, you're right. Uh, 
um before we end that in that chat um so 2022 do you have a fight a, a fight that is planned soon or not yet any opportunities short term to fight not yet not yet maybe soon we don't know so promoters, <laughs> yeah, promoters around soon. the world this girl want to fight <laughs> send their opportunities <laughs> <laughs> so we really hope to see you soon because you know you had two fast um opportunities um in the second half let's say of 2021 um yeah. so we really hope you you to see you soon uh, as soon as possible uh, because because we want to see more of mary spencer as a pro we have seen a lot <laughs> we saw a lot of mary spencer as an amateur as an olympian uh, uh but we want to see uh, more of mary spencer as a pro as well and we want to see mary spencer having opportunities fast opportunities that's what uh, i wish you for 2000 uh, for 2022 i like that wish i like that yeah. wish thank you we, we all want that but i i i really want that because i as i said i'm a fan of you and i know what you can do even if you don't want me to say it <laughs> you don't want me thank to you. tell the opponents that you're so good we can let them find out you're the den you're dangerous <laughs> in this division <laughs> thank, thank you so much for your time no joke thank I'm you very it, was really, it was really fun chatting yeah 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 and uh, i i i will uh, i will fo follow what's uh, what's gonna happen for you this year for sure and i really uh, you, are you on social media uh, people can add you on instagram on twitter to follow what uh, you're not so present on social media right you're quite discreet you're not like uh, what you're is not social sure. media anyway. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. like facebook and all you know, that stuff you're not so you're not the you're not a show off on that kind of uh, no i'll tell you i'll tell you what i am i'm 37 and this st this stuff is still new to me and feels a little bit weird <laughs> I know That's you have a Twitter is. account. I saw you have a Twitter account. You have an Instagram account. So okay. people at least can follow you on that. So they will know yeah. about uh, your fight opportunities and your results and so on. Uh, so I'll, I will I'll, invite I'll you. I'll update on my Instagram. I'll, I'll try and be I'll invite them to follow it. you, even if you're okay. uh, you're 37 and you don't like that, <laughs> much, that kind of stuff and you're learning it. <laughs> that's that's okay oh no I mean. not learning it no I'm, <laughs> no I'm good with that part and it's just <laughs> i don't want it to take a big place in my life that's all <laughs> that that's good that's good we can understand this as well so thank you so much and i wish you a tremendous 2022 mary thank you thank very you. much for Same your time you. have a good night thank you